Okay, so we'll go back to another video. So here we have an improper integral from zero to infinity of x squared times cosine of 4x divided by x to the power of 4 plus 4, then dx. So I think this is actually a perfect exercise when we're dealing with complex analysis. Specifically, we're dealing with an improper integral combined with polynomials and the trigonometric functions. So what does this mean? That we actually had to apply residue theory in order to help tackle such integrals. But we'll get too into some of that eventually. There are still a little bit of observations in the beginning we want to make first before we get into the whole, you know, spiel of complex analysis applying to that as well. So there's also a lemma that we'll be using, but instead of just justifying with just that lemma itself, I'm actually going to show out the full calculation too, and just for you guys to get the bigger picture out of it. So uh, other than that, so just expect to see a lot of, you know, imaginary numbers and that stuff. So let's actually just jump right in. So notice something for our integrand. We have x squared cosine 4x divided by x to the power of 4 plus 4. So you'll notice that this function is actually an even function. So with symmetry, what I can do is I can actually rewrite this into a different integral. So in other words, this is the same thing as written as from negative infinity. Well, rather, this is one half of the entire real line of our bounds. So this is one half, then multiply with our real line in, um, integral. So positive infinity and negative infinity of x squared cosine of 4x and then divided by x to the power of 4 plus 4 then dx. That's a good observation from there. So let's actually notice something. Another thing we'll apply is Euler's formula, which says that e to the power i x is equal to cosine of x and then add this with i times sine of x. And what you'll notice is that the cosine of 4x, so with the imaginary parts and the real parts, if we actually take the equate to that, so we'll notice that the real part is going to equal some part of the cosine. So 4x, so I'll just plug the 4 back into here. And so therefore, we have that cosine of 4x is equal to the real part of e to the power 4 times i times x. So that's a good substitution we can make to plug this back in. And so therefore, really, the what we need to calculate is one half times the real of our integral. So negative infinity to positive infinity of x squared, then multiply with e to the power of 4 times i times x, then divided by x to the power of 4, then plus 4 dx. With this in mind, now let's actually now jump into the world of complex analysis. We're actually going to now consider our function in terms of the uh, variable z. So f of z we're going to consider is z squared multiplied by e to the power of 4 times i times z, then divided by z to the power of 4, and then add this 4. So with this in mind, we're going to actually have to apply some contour integration. So now let's actually split up how our bounds should look like. And of course, I'll also draw a diagram um, supporting this as well. So let us consider our following graph. So we're going to consider the top half of the plane, and then this is the upper semicircle we're going to be considering. So just like this. And so first, our bounds is going to be from positive r and then negative r over here. So we're going to split this up. We're going to call this entire contour. So we'll call this the del of d. So I call that like as the, the boundary. So, so let's call our real axis. We'll call this line the line segment del of r. And then we're going to actually going to call our little curve over here c sub r. And so, of course, when you're dealing with this, this is actually do, going in the positive orientation. So clockwise, counterclockwise, and to say, say that, and I'll list the imaginary Z. So that means in the going in this direction, as I denote these arrows over here, we're going to split this in the union of our bounds for the domain or our boundary. So del of D is the same thing as del of R, and then just take the union. So C of R. So that's like dealing with different two different types of sets. Okay. And so when we're dealing with contour integration, so that means our contour from our domain over here, f of z, this is simply just breaking this up. So we have our contour starting with for the del of r of f of z dz, and then add this with our contour from the, the, the arc, so c sub r of f of z dc. And I also need to create a little parameterization equations for these line segments and the arc length to satisfy this. So we're going to create two different equations over here. Our del of r is going to be in the set, so for t, such that this is in between negative r less than or equal to t, less than or equal to positive r. And then our curve, so c of r is our following set. So this is going to be r times e to the power i t, such that the domain is in between from 0 
uh, less than or equal to t, less than or equal to pi. So you can see that that's the construction of our circle. So this is dealing with half of the upper circle right there. And so now we're gonna take things one at a time. So let's actually first calculate our arc length curve of the boundary for our f of c function. So we're actually gonna take this in form of a limit. So the limit as capital R approaches positive infinity and then of our arc length curve c sub r f of z dz. With this, let's now actually make some calculations over here. So in other words, I'll put this as the same thing as the limit as r approaches infinity of the integral c sub r of z squared e to the power four i z and then divided by z to the power four plus four dz. Okay, so here's some things that we need to note. So we actually know that the modulus of z is actually gonna equal r because it lies anywhere in between the line and that's our length over there. So now we need to actually take our little absolute value since that's actually calculating what we need to do for over here of the light of the arc length. So notice that the absolute value of e to the power four times i times z, same thing as written as now put this in substitute for the complex number x plus i times y. So e to the power four times i then x plus i times y. Same thing in other words to say that we can put this as a multiplication of absolute value. So e to the power four times i times x then multiply with e to the power negative four times y. And we notice that if I take the modulus of this, this is actually going to approach one. Then that actually leaves us with e to the power negative four times um, y, which actually y is, as we're looking at this from our contour, is we're dealing with anything strictly greater than, well, greater than or equal to zero. So no matter what you plug in here, we can actually create ourselves a little bound. So that means this is actually gonna be less than or equal to positive one. So that's a good bound to put in over here. Let's now take into account our z squared and then z to the power four plus four. So if I take the absolute value of this, so z squared divided by z to the four plus four. In other words, that's the same thing as taking the absolute value z, then square that, then divided by z to the power four plus four. Now take a look at the z to the power four plus four. What I can do here is we can actually apply some triangle inequality, specifically the reverse triangle inequality to say that now, let me actually put this in the bottom first and I'll just get rid of it in a sec. The absolute value z to the power 4 plus 4 is greater than or equal to the absolute value of the absolute value of z to the power 4 subtract 4. And then we can just substitute this for where we say the modulus of z is equal to r. So we can say that this inequality over here is greater than or equal to r to the power 4 subtract 4. With this in mind, and it, because it's in the denominator, so now I can actually just flip the sign of our inequality over here of the rational function to say that this is actually going to be less than or equal to r to the power square, and then divided by r to the power four, subtract four. Okay, so I think we have everything that's come in handy. So now let's actually take the absolute value of our integral over here, over the, the arc length curve. So now putting this together, so I have the integral the absolute value of the integral from CR of z squared, then e for iz, then divided by z to the power of four plus four dz. Then I can actually apply the inequality relation that I can actually take the integral of the absolute value of each ones. So the integral c sub r and then the absolute value z squared, then absolute value e to the four iz, then now divided by z to the power four plus four, take the absolute value of that dz. And then now we can actually just substitute. So this is still creating as a, again, as a lower bound, well rather the less than or equal to this bound over here. So we'll plug in c sub r, and then now this is gonna be r squared divided by r to the power four minus four dz. This is just a constant and we we'll evaluate this on z to r. So basically this is the same thing as calculating the r's length. So this is equal to just pi times r and then multiply by here. So in other words, then we'll combine this together we're taking the limit as r approaches infinity of pi times r to the cube and then divided by r to the power four minus four, which if you take that limit is indeed going to approach zero. And what's nice is that, as I said, this is actually a lemma known as Jordan's lemma. And this actually works such that if we actually apply this whole thing and we're dealing with a rational polynomial such that the numerator of that polynomial's degree is less than the one specifically, if the degree of the numerator is less than or equal to one plus, 
the degree on the denominator, then we would just apply all this out. We're always going to get that by Jordan's lemma. It's always going to approach zero on this arc length over here. So that actually just takes care of one. So now we actually now have to deal with this integral over here since this approach is zero. So now moving on, so I have that therefore, if we just put everything together, so the boundary of D of F of Z DZ is therefore just equal to just the boundary for now. If we're dealing this with the over the X axis, so this is just the real line. So positive infinity to negative infinity of F of Z DZ. Okay, so that's left. So now we just have to calculate this integral over here. So now we're gonna apply residue theorem. So this says the following that if we have a simple closed curve, so yes, we do over the over our function. So the contour integral of del D of F of Z. Therefore, it's this is actually going to equal two pi times I and then times your sum of all the residues it's being evaluated at. So the residue of F of Z at some term for the ZJs where seeds of J's are the ones that are the poles that such that it lies inside of our contour. So to find our poles, we actually have to pay attention to our denominator for Z to the power of 4 plus 4. And if you actually solve all this out for finding our simple poles for Z to Z to the power of 4 plus 4 equals 0, we're going to get we're going to get four different solutions. We have that Z is going to equal to 1 plus I, another one negative 1 plus I, then we're going to have negative 1 subtract I, and then the last one we have 1 subtract I. So if we think about how I graph where these points are and if it lies on the contour, so 1 plus I is going to lie over here, negative 1 plus I is going to lie over here, negative 1 minus I is going to be right below here, and then our 1 minus I is going to fall below over here. So you'll notice that we have two different poles that lie outside of our contour, which means that we can actually just disregard those poles. And we have the other two poles, specifically 1 plus i and negative 1 plus i that lies in those poles. So therefore, we have to calculate two different residues and then take our sums from there. So now with this, I'm actually just going to get rid of um, pretty much almost everything that we listed over here and then make some room for the continuation of the work. Listing out, reiterate yet again that applying residue theory that the contour of the entire boundary of f of z is going to equal 2 pi i and n times the sum of our residues evaluated at those simple poles. So we have two different poles that lie inside our contour, so we're going to actually do two separate calculations to find both of our residues before adding everything together as one. So first, let's actually calculate our first pole. So the first residue we're calculating is the residue of f of z, and then our first pole we'll be looking at is 1 plus i. Okay. So in other words, that's the same thing as taking, if we apply this definition over here, and if we decompose the denominator z to the power of 4 plus 4, that would have to mean that terms, one of the terms at that pole is going to cancel. So I'll leave to the simplification to say that applying that, so we have the limit as z approaches 1 plus i. So let me first write out what our denominator is for this situation. We have z minus 1 plus i multiply with z plus 1 subtract i and then our other one is going to be z plus 1 and then add this with i and of course we have our denominator our numerator z squared multiplied by e to the power of 4 times i times z there's a lot going on to do the calculation and plug this all in so i'll actually simplify everything together you can also verify this yourself if you want to so in the end if you plug everything out simplify everything so it's nice and clean we're going to have that this will come down to just positive 1 subtract i, multiply by e to the power 4i, and then divide this by 8 times e to the power 4. Okay, so that's one residue down, so let's actually now deal with the other pole. So the residue of f of z, then our second pole is going to be negative 1 plus i. So in other words, now I write this as the limit as z approaches negative 1 plus i. So as you can see that one of the terms from the denominator has to cancel with that numerator that we're evaluating at that pole. So this will yield us the denominator we will have under is z minus 1 minus i. Multiply by z subtract 1, add this with i, and then multiply with z plus 1 plus i. And of course, the numerator z squared and then e to the power of 4 times i times z. And then we actually just simplify all this out yet again, do the same thing. So this will yield us negative 1 minus i, then multiply with e to the negative 4 times i, and then divide it by 
8 times e to the power 4. So now we have both our residues. Let's actually just calculate over here, going back to here. So now I have 2 times pi times i, and then now just substitute the values. So I have 1 minus i, then multiply with e to the power 4 times i, divided by 8 times e to the power 4. Add this with negative 1 minus i, then e to the power 4i, or negative 4i and then divide it by 8 times e to the power 4. So if I now distribute the i back into here, we're just taking things one step at a time. So this is 2 pi. And so if I distribute the i, so now that will give us, this will be i and then minus or plus 1, then times e to the power 4i, and then divide it by 8 times e to the power 4. Distribute the i to this one, so plus. So inside I have negative i, then i squared, so that's 1. And then this will be minus i, then e to the negative 4i divided by 8 times e to the power 4. Okay, so let's actually um, simplify even further and combine everything together with 2 pi and then with the, also combining the denominator as the common denominator as well. Then also factoring out the pi together. So I'll have that this is the same thing as pi multiply by e to the power 4i, add this with i times e to the negative 4i. Add this with i times e to the power 4i. Add this with e to the negative 4i. And then add this with, or rather subtract, i times e to the negative 4i. And then this is being divided by 4 times e to the power 4. Now here's some two form here. So here's some two definitions of complex exponentials with trigonometric functions related that we'll be using. We'll have that cosine of z is equal to e to the power i x, add this with e to the negative i x divided by two. And another one is that sine of z is going to equal to e to the i x minus e to the negative i x divided by two i. So this will come in handy that we can actually group these together if we do the math carefully. That as we notice that first if we group the e to the four i's, so that means I have e to the four i then add this with e to the negative 4i. Again, with that definition, I just put this back in. So then put that together. So I'll have that this is the same thing as equal to two times cosine of four. Okay, and then now going back, so another one is that we have the imaginary units. So i times e to the positive 4i, subtract i to the i times e to the negative 4i. And if we do that math carefully, so this is two times i, then, well, multiply by another i, so negative. So this will be negative two times sine of four. So with this, now we can actually just plug everything back together. And so we can conclude that with our contour integral at the, at the domain of the boundary, so del d of f of z dz is indeed just equal to just pi times two times cosine of four, subtract two times sine of four, and then divide it by four times e to the power four, okay? And then in other words, that's basically the same thing as saying this is the real integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of z squared e to the 4 times i times z divided by z to the power 4 plus 4 and then dz. But we're basically, that about just wraps it up. So therefore, going back into the conclusion, 0 to infinity of our given. So x squared cosine of 4x divided by x to the power 4 plus 4 then dx, we have this integral is equal to just one half times the real part of this integral, just in now we're back into x, which we found the value that this is the real part, which there actually indeed is no imaginary, you know, associated with it. So pi times cosine of four minus two sine of four, and then divided by four e to the power four, nothing with that, then I can factor out the two and that gets rid of it. And so therefore indeed that this is the final answer, the real part and the answer to this integral over here is equal to just pi times cosine of four minus sine of four, and then divided by four times e to the power four, just like that. That actually completes our long computation of solving using contour integration, just like that. A perfect exercise, you might say so myself. So yeah, that's uh, pretty cool if you ask me.